Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. So very good to be here with all of you by the grace of God. It is good to open the word together and to hear the word of God together here today. It is a blessing. The, tr the truth is, is that it is a blessing. And I'm happy to be here with all of you. It is a blessing to hear the word of God together, to worship together, and to be conduits of that same blessing when we leave this place. My hope and prayer is that you leave this place empowered by the Holy Spirit to take on this mission in the world. Would you please stand if you are able and join me in our opening call to worship. Here we are, gathered together in God's house, both by need and because we are accustomed to it. Among us are those who bring love, laughter, grief, and pain. Some believing, some rejoicing, some afraid, and some in doubt. We come with questions, spoken and unspoken. We are seeking truth, inspiration, and instruction. We have heard the glowing stories of the things that God has done, of his power and his glory, of his love in Christ, his son, of his promptings through the Holy Spirit. O oh God of human transformation, we now pray for your presence in this time of worship. Lead us on our faith journey, even as we are gathered here today. Amen. Join me in prayer for a moment. Heavenly Father, we come today seeking Jesus, seeking your face. And so we ask you, Jesus, to lead us in worship today. Reveal the Father to us in spirit and in truth. And may we leave this place, not like people who forget what we look like in the mirror, but called to your mission in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Please take a moment and say hi to somebody. I know it started outside. Keep going on inside. Give a high five, a hug. There's plenty of people to say hi to you probably haven't seen before. All right. the Lord and we are wonderfully happy to have several out-of-town guests here so it's that was great that there was such a good greeting time um, we're going to start with some uh, two praise songs okay first one is gather us in Thank you. 
Christ alone our hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. In Christ alone Forgive us, Lord, so that we will shine with your glory. Amen. 
God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. All the prophets testify about Christ, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Ellie and I have a song for you, and it's one that is in our hymnal, so we'll have it projected. We'd like uh, it to be one that the congregation can learn. So um, it, we're just sort of introducing a new, new-ish song. see so many faces uh, uh, in the pew, especially folks we haven't seen in a while. It is a blessing, a blessing to see you guys here. I, uh, I'm here uh, now to just let you know a few things important. If you happen to pull out a bulletin from the doors as you walked and made your way in, if you happen to have a sticker in your bulletin, that means you are our lucky prize winner, okay? So come and find me after service. I have something just for you. And if you're not really interested in receiving any pri uh, you know, prizes of any sorts, there are kids here that are more than willing to take that up for you in Christian service. 
So please make sure to find a few. I'm sure they will not tell you no. Uh, a few things I would like to highlight from the bulletin today, just to call your attention to it. Please know that on the very back, all the info you may ever need to contact church leadership, get a hold of me, set up a meeting, that is where you will find it. Please make sure to take advantage of that. Uh, a few things from the bulletin uh, to note today, we have a potluck after service today. So if you are here and you did not bring something and are guilting yourself into not coming to the potluck because you didn't bring something, that is not going to work, okay? <laughs> Just saying. There is plenty of food, okay? So unless there's like a major emergency, you can't leave, okay? This is, this is not, I'm kidding. Seriously, though, but the food's great. And we would love to invite you guys to break bread with us. It's one of the wonderful things about fellowship here that I uh, would love all of you to experience. So church potluck today after service. Uh, uh, two more things that I'll bring uh, and I'll, you know, hop off announcements. <laughs> uh, uh, volunteer opportunities. There are a few that I would like to bring up. First off, we need a coffee server for the fourth Sunday of each month. So if you feel that God is leading you to serve this body in that way, please make sure to connect with, uh, 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 with Ruth or Sharon Korn. Uh, there's also a sign-up sheet, I'm, I'm pretty sure, by the coffee after service, although we're going to have potluck today, so uh, might want to connect with Ruth or Sharon on that. All right, uh, we also need a volunteer in the audiovisual area, so if you uh, are not afraid of computers and are willing to learn something new, you're the person we need. Find me. <laughs> I would love to talk to you about what that looks like. Uh, finally, uh, uh, we do have leftovers this evening, so if you have questions from last week or questions about the series or questions about today, please make sure. Uh, today at church, 7 p.m., we hold leftovers uh, uh, together here at the church library at 7 p.m. So if you happen to have any, please make sure to bring them over, and if not, just slip me a piece of paper after service. Yes? I have one more announcement that I forgot to put in the bulletin. Uh oh um, This Wednesday night, we're trying something new as just a fellowshipping time. And that is there will be a little campfire out in outside of our church. And I'll bring my guitar and maybe I can get Nick too. And um, we'll sing some campfire songs and have uh, a little campfire. Jim's in charge of that. S'mores! <laughs> so it's, oh, and Ruth, did he say 6 or 6.30? Oh, yeah. Oh, 6.30, Wednesday night, outside a little campfire stand. That's going to be awesome. Just in case. All right. Uh, so if there is anything you have questions, you want to get, uh, you know, you want to be a part of the mailing list that receives the bulletin and the list of things to pray for during the week, please make sure to connect with us here at the office. We would love to add you to that list. All right. And now, ladies and gentlemen, now we move on to my favorite part of the service. This is the chance, well, one of my favorite parts of the service where we get a chance to listen to each other. We get a chance to pray together. What are some of the things that we can pray for? Together, things that we can celebrate with you, what good news do you have to share, or what can we lament with you? What's the bad news, too? We want some of that, too. So we hold all those things in tandem. Elders, please make your way up so we can hand out these mics. And church, what can we pray for, celebrate, or lament today? I mean, there's a lot of things to celebrate. I see faces everywhere. I'm so happy to see. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure I was first here. Uh, uh, my mother-in-law could sure use your prayers right now, Carol Riley. She's uh, really kind of struggling. Had a really bad night last night uh, mentally and thought there was someone in the house called the police. Maybe that was a couple nights ago, but but she's been struggling uh, with some weakness in her legs and just, you know, she's, she's 81, so she's getting up there and she could use your prayers. And by the same token, my dog... Uh, he kind of, it's so weird how he's sensitive to that because he knew, he somehow knew that. And he was antsy also, so they're kind of tracking along and he's he's up there too. And I'm not sure why I brought my dog into it necessarily. But <laughs> <laughs> What's your dog's name? We'll pray for the dog. Griff, Griff. His name is Griffy. Okay. And, and he can also use your prayers. Yeah. <laughs> Family members, man, we pray for all of them. Yeah. You bet. What else can we pray for? Celebrate. Yes. As you know, my sister has been through quite an ordeal um, this past year or so, and the Lord has brought her so close. She's still receiving treatments, but he has blessed her with another birthday today, 72 years oh, old, and I'm so thankful for that. Definitely. Good girl. Yes. I had a very successful trip over to Montana and back, Happy to um, able to ease my mind and connect with my sister. Um, but I think one of the biggest blessings I had was coming back over the past at a 
rest stop. Uh, there was a homeless gentleman in his van, and something told me I needed to go talk to him. And for, after a lengthy conversation with a Vietnam vet, um, uh, we connected on several levels. And it was, I think it was just, just a blessing to both of us. We both needed that. So thankful for that. May we all be sensitive to the, I don't know what told me to go there to do that. Amen to that. Amen to that. Yes. My dad, Paul Hackett, is in the hospital in Anacortes. He, they're treating him for pneumonia. And so prayers for Paul, my dad, who's in the hospital, prayers for my mom, who's at Regency, and I've been staying with her because she's quite dependent. I mean, the eyes, hands, feet. So um, I've been helping her out. So it's kind of hard because I can't be in two places at once. My brother Dave is helping. He came up from Bothell. Oh, good. Thank you for sharing that. We'll be praying for both of you. Over here. One second, Jim. Yes. We want to thank everybody for praying for our grandson, Luke. Yes. He came out of the hospital Saturday. Everything seems going pretty well. It was a tough road. And he's have to wear an interferences for a month to keep his blood clean. So God is good. All the time. Good news. Thank you. Yes, definitely keep praying though, for sure, for a full recovery. What else can we pray for? So, yes, Jim, sorry. I'd like to thank the uh, brothers and sisters here who have paid for the instruments we have. And uh, what a great investment. And I hope we continue to be a church that looks for investing Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to share um, the this week. Rich and I were looking at a repair at the Oxford House. It's a women's shelter that we host in our old parsonage, and uh, met up with a lady there, a young lady that I recognized from the Haven, and uh, from seeing her on the bus a year or two ago, and. We talked for a bit and just the transition that she was able to make from being homeless on the streets, getting her life together there at the Oxford House, her appearance, everything was night and day from what I remembered from a year and a half, two years ago. Just wanted to share that God's blessing these ministries that we can accommodate through our facilities. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. I I would like to ask prayers for uh, Bonnie Alkama. Bonnie is our sister-in-law, and she fell on Friday, broke two bones in her lower right leg. And um, so she was taken to Harbor View, and she was wait awaiting surgery. It was too full. The schedule was too full. So they have managed the pain. Um, and I guess she did have a good night's rest. So prayers for Bonnie and Les Alkama, please. Definitely, for sure. Thank you for sharing that. By the way, these prayer requests get sent out every week on a list. If you want that list, you could be praying along with everybody else. Hook up with your bulletin. All right. Yes. Yeah, Gene and Marv's brother, Greg, has had a rough few weeks, but finally went to the doctor, got, finally got to go to the doctor, and he had some surgery on Friday on his foot. Um, they had to take out the rod that holds his foot together, so, but it's now filled with antibiotics. He looks good. He's very chipper. He's also in Anacortes Hospital. I don't know when he's coming home, but he could use some prayers as well. It's been a rough road. For sure. Thanks for sharing that. Definitely. Can't imagine. <laughs> hey, Pastor Andy. It's good to see you, bud. Hey, Nick. We are here just, uh, just celebrating with you guys, and it is so nice just to sit in the pew <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I'm fixing to do that next week. <laughs> I'm just well, going to sing my heart out and praise the Lord and uh, just be in the presence with all of you. It's, it's, I'm very thankful for what God has done and is doing. So, thanks be to God. We're blessed to have you, I'm sure. I'm sure so many of us are so happy you're here. What else can we pray for? Celebrate and lament, you guys. What else can we pray for? Celebrate and lament. Frankie, how's that truck doing? It's running. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Well, going once, going twice. 
in lieu of my wife, who would probably do it, I'm going to do her a favor. Please keep praying for the school. Yes, we are still in need of a few teachers. So if you feel God is calling you to serve in Christian education, please connect with my wife, who is in the back. Over there. Hey, honey, yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love you so much. Anyway, so uh, please pray for the Christian school. Please pray for Sally as the head of school over there. There's a, there's a new year coming up here right after the summer, and um, there's just a lot to work through and get ready for, so please keep her in your prayers as well. And now, let's pray together, yeah? And so, Jesus, it is our privilege that we can give back to you that we can gather together and give back songs, give back worship, give back the desires of our heart to give. And we ask God that you would bless the offering that we give today, whether it be financial, whether it be in worship, whether it be whatever, wherever it comes from, whatever two mites you are calling us to give today. We wanna thank you for that ability. And we ask that you bless what we give for the building of your kingdom. We want to thank you, God, that we are able to be here today in person, that we are able to wake up this morning and see the sun rise and be here, present and surrounded by those we love, those you call us to serve. Father, I ask that, that, even, at, that even as we sing songs, even as we spend time together today, that we not forget that we are here to exalt the name of Jesus. All hail King Jesus. Forever may you reign. And as we ask you to reign, Father, that your kingdom come and that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, we are reminded, God, of how it isn't in some and many ways. We are reminded of those among us who aren't here. We are reminded of those who can't be here for one reason or another. We give them to you. Pray on their behalf for their recovery, for their healing, both emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. We ask that you would give us that awareness of the thing that tells us we should go do something. That we'd be more sensitive to the moving of your Holy Spirit. To have ears that hear and eyes that see. Jesus, we ask that as disciples, you give us that heart and that desire to serve in the ways that you do, within the truth that you teach and in the life that you live. Father, we think of those who have bad news in our number today. We think of those who live consistent lives, being reminded of bad news. We think of those who, who suffer in one way or another. Whether it be family going through surgery, family recovering from mental illness, or even just our dog. Father, we want to bring to you all of the things that we have on our heart. You call us to cast all of our burdens May this space be a space we do that together. A space where we are vulnerable with one another as we engage the word of God. A space where we can grow together and see Jesus in each one of us. Father, we ask that in all that we do today, whether it be singing, installations, sermons, celebrations, may, be, may we be reminded that we are called as participants. Participants in your nature. For some of us, that is a call to move from inactivity into participation. For some of us, it is a call to see how much we participate. And for others, if our participation is towards you and your nature. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask today that as we open the word, and as we engage the word, that you would give us a heart that understands and ears that hear and follows you. 
as we asked earlier, may we not be the kind of people who, like some who look in the mirror and walk away and forget what they look like. May we not be that way with the word today. But bring the word to life in our actions. May our works bring our faith to life. May we be compelled and called to do so by the power of your Holy Spirit today. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. amen and amen. Church, would you please join us, if you would, for the song, Humble Thyself in the Sight of the Lord. front here with your parents or guardians. This is probably my favorite, definitely top favorite for sure. If you guys can make your way up here, we will pray and bless you guys. And, uh, 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 and if you can't, don't worry about it. But if you would, you could because then we can all join too. So church, they're going to make their way up here. Um, we're going to lay hands on our kids and bless them. And church, if you would join us in extending your hands in this way and kind of join us in blessing the kids. This is, oh, yes. this is one of the many beautiful ways where we fulfill, this is one of the many ways that we fulfill our commitment to walk with the people who join this body. Amen? So, join me in blessing our kids today. May God bless you and keep you. May God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine over you and show you his grace. May he make his face to shine over you and show you his grace. May we show you his grace. May we show you his grace. And the love of the Father. And the love of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. For the world he loves so much. And all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Good stuff. Thanks, you guys. Please join Marvin and Marge as they make their way out the door. There's something special for you guys. All right, now we will have our Bible reading um, uh, uh, from, uh, from the scriptures of Philippians chapter 2. Thank you, Gary. Be right with you. I used to a wired mic. <laughs> uh, the reading is from Philippians 2. Verses 1 through 11, page 1260 in your pew Bibles, if you want to follow along. This is imitating Christ's humility. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, brother. Well, good morning once again. A big hello and welcome to all of you who are here, to those who are watching online. We love you guys. Please know that if you have any questions here or online, please make sure to leave them in the comments or make sure to slip them to me, uh, you know, piece of paper, come tonight to Leftovers. A very warm welcome to all of our guests joining us here today. We are so glad you are here and for the family here with us. Thank you for the blessing of encountering the love, way, and life of Jesus in you today. My prayer is that you leave this place refreshed and challenged, and that we find ourselves compelled by the love of God to engage in his mission in the world. Today, church, we are continuing our series in the book of Philemon. So if you don't have a Bible with you yet from the reading, please make sure to grab one. You might need it as we go through it. Grab one from the nearest pew. If you don't have one, you're probably going to want to look at it as we go along. I also strongly recommend that if this is your first time engaging this series, do follow up online and catch up for more context. Some of the stuff I say today won't make sense without some context, so I do encourage you to watch the rest of the series to catch up and get some more of that context. Philemon is one of our expository series where the focus is just a little bit different than in our accustomed topical styles. In a topical series, as we've said over the past few weeks, we engage in a topic or an issue and approach it from the point of view of the biblical authors. While in the expository one, we dive deeply into the biblical text and learn how to read it properly. These types of series are meant to help us learn how to read our Bibles properly, taking them seriously as we've been learning over the past few weeks. We've been emphasizing how important it is to give the text a chance to speak for itself independently when we read it. We must learn to engage and use the scriptures as the blade or the sharp edge that it describes itself as. The living and active sharp edge that can cut right through us and our BS and stuff. And get to the heart of the matter. However, too many of us forget that how we read, how we wield the word, can change so much about how it is received and understood. And that matters. That matters a whole lot. Too many believers today do not consider that if the word of God is a sharp edge, we can be surgeons with it, carefully and skillfully healing others, or butchers with it, dangerously swinging around something meant to save, something I sometimes catch myself doing in all my excitement and zeal, at times even from the pulpit. But thanks be to God for the grace of a Savior who loves me into learning how to care like he does. Dear church, to skillfully engage scripture, one must learn how to read. And it all begins with our approach as readers. Hmm? We've said over the past few weeks that when you engage the Bible, you are not walking or picking up a single book. You are walking into a library of 66 books. A full library of 66 books. Different writings of the biblical corpus were written in distinct languages. Part of the Bible was written in Greek. Part of the Bible was written in Hebrew. And even some books were written in Aramaic. There were three separate languages that make up the entirety of the book. The Bible includes narratives from the first century CE as well as stories about the beginnings of the cosmos. But most, of, but most biblical scholars agree that the books we find these stories in reach their present forms over the course of 500 years between 350 BC and 150 CE. So while the stories and content may be placed in different historical contexts centuries ago, their final written forms wouldn't be completed and compiled until much, much later. Even the New Testament makes references to extra biblical sources, like the book of Enoch in Luke 3, Hebrews 11, Jude 1, meaning that there are external sources worth studying, getting into if we're going to read some of these writings properly too. How we read matters. What we read matters. The Bible library includes multiple human authors with differing voices and perspectives from within human history. 
as reflected in the literary style of their writings. We have different genre types of biblical literature. We've talked about this, right? There's genealogies, there's narrative literature, there's poetic literature, there's prophetic literature, there's apocalyptic literature, there's prayers and lament, there's gospels, letters, legal codes. And the reason I'm mentioning this and why it's important is you wouldn't walk into a library, pick up a book of poetry, and read it like an encyclopedia article, right? You don't go looking for facts in poetry. We read it differently. Creative writing in scripture uses a number of things so that it is creative human writing. You have poetic literature like the Psalms. They use things like, like similes, hyperboles, comparisons, images. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. What do they look like? Trees planted by rivers of water, yielding fruit in its season and leaves don't wither. Poetry. You with me? How you read matters. What you are reading matters. Many of us have a tendency to see and read the Bible <clears throat> as a single book united in voice and of one mind. The assumption that the Bible manifests as an ecclesiastical how to do church and a theological how to engage God and read the Bible paradigm, which allows readers to synthesize texts that are separated by several centuries and virtually irreconcilable worldviews in order to achieve the extraction of doctrines and administrative guidelines. Univocality, or the notion that the Bible speaks with one voice on any particular subject, is not the case of Scripture. And it is an unhelpful approach to reading Scripture, assuming univocality. We simply cannot just assume that when we read the scriptures. We've been giving the example of marriage lately. I have another example for us today. When the Bible speaks about slavery, for instance, since it's very relevant to Philemon, when the Bible speaks about it, it doesn't speak about it with one voice either. For example, in the book of Exodus 21, when it talks about slavery in Exodus, it says that it's a death penalty for anybody who kidnaps somebody else to sell them to slavery. Okay? Now, this of course is specific. You can't kidnap an Israelite to sell them to slavery just like Joseph's brothers did to him. Remember that story? That. So this is what this passage says is not allowed. But then you go over to Leviticus 25, and you get a completely different picture of slavery. Chattel slavery was condoned in the Old Testament, as long as they weren't Hebrew. Right? So on one end, it's the death penalty. On the other end, it's fully condoned. And not just fully condoned, it's condoned for the entire life of the property, as the verse describes. You move over to Colossians chapter 3, and you'll have Paul telling Christians to, telling Christian slaves to obey their earthly masters and everything they do, comparing them to how we are to uh, call to serve Christ. Then you'll go over to Philemon in our book today, in verse 16, where Paul calls Philemon to see Onesimus no longer as a slave. So just in these four or five verses, a completely different way to see slavery as you go through it. And this would be reflected in the church's history too, in how we engage scripture to talk about this subject. All of this is to teach that the voice of scripture on this one subject is so varied that the Bible itself will be used as a tool of both slavery and abolition by proponents of either side in the 18th and early 19th centuries as a matter of historical record. To arrive, to arrive to our modern interpretations, we have to negotiate with the texts. There is simply no way around that. When you are interpreting scripture, you have to wear lenses to read it, to interpret. It's a reality of reading the Bible. Assuming the Bible's text, by the way, that it all points to Jesus as the one unified story of humanity is not the same as assuming univocality. While many biblical authors had differing visions, voices, and perspectives on who the messenger of the Lord was from the Torah, or who the suffering servant is in the book of Isaiah of the prophets, or who the triumphant anointed king of the Psalms is, the biblical text itself, like John the Baptist and his ministry, is all meant to do one thing. I am but the voice in the wilderness. 
that says, Behold the Lamb of God. The purpose of this book, what is to happen when you engage this book, the life that comes to life through the Holy Spirit in you when you read this book, is because this book points to Jesus. Do you hear me? It is because this book points to Jesus. We must make space for the hard work of letting texts speak for themselves in their contexts and historical perspectives to take them seriously as opposed to perhaps literally. Sometimes we make the mistake of seeing simple and literal readings as a virtue when in reality they can be theologically lazy. Reflecting an unwillingness to engage the whole of the biblical corpus in favor of specific verses that fit what we've always known. Literal readings are appropriate for genres like legal codes, genealogies, and perhaps even some narratives, but not the whole thing. I know it's a lot to take in, and do try to bear this in mind while we put some of this into practice in this letter to Philemon. This is one of the Bible's most personal letters of a pastor trying to bring people together into the love, way, and mind of Christ. This is a very personal letter. You know, a lot of folks think that being a pastor is all about these lofty things of like, you know, sitting down to write this really lofty, intense theological sermon. We spend more time putting out fires, bro, okay, like, <laughs> or dealing with things or trying to bring people together. Yes? And this letter is that. Paul is trying to bring two people together that belong in the same church and using the church to hold them accountable to each other. Bear that in mind as you read the letter of Philemon. Hmm? So before we jump in in depth, pray with me and we'll jump right into Philemon. Oh, good Father, open my lips today so that my mouth can declare your praise. Jesus, may you come to life in our reading of your word today. As we challenge ourselves, our reading of scripture, our perceptions of the word, Holy Spirit, teach us about what we have in Christ. As we open the book and see the letter of Philemon today, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Give us the courage to engage your word for what it says, the discernment, God, to read it properly, and the wisdom, God, to know the difference. Give us the courage, God. Spirit of God, open our eyes that we may see wonders from your word today. For you and your kingdom's sake, we ask all of these things. All of God's people said, Amen. <coughs> the Colossae house church was abuzz with people and whispering. Onesimus is here? With a letter for the master from Paul himself? What might he have to say? Would he tell Onesimus what he had told another church in nearby Ephesus, assuming Paul wrote Ephesians, <clears throat> to obey his master in all things as if he were serving the Lord Jesus? Onesimus began to read the letter. To our beloved co-worker, Philemon, to our sister, Apia, to our fellow soldier, Archippus, and to the church in your house. Why is he including all of us? Does he really want all of us to bear witness to him reading, processing, and responding to this letter? <clears throat> this might not end up too well for Onesimus. To Philemon, Onesimus was useless as a play on his name. <clears throat> Sorry, verse 11. To, One uh, to Philemon, Onesimus was useless as a play on his name. But how can a slave who can read, write, process, and display unwavering loyalty, especially when in Paul's service, be considered useless? Where'd that come from? Is Paul really calling him out for that? Ooh, is that why they were separated? Because of how Philemon sees Onesimus? You can see the slave's hands shake as he got to verse 15. Could you imagine... A slave reading this to his master in ancient Rome? Perhaps this is the reason Onesimus was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but more.
By the way, Paul has yet to call him a slave in the letter. He never will. Paul never refers to Onesimus as a slave. Unless he's talking to Philemon about who he used to be, not who he is. And that's important too. His voice confidently carries Paul's message. Perhaps the reason he was separated from Onesimus was to have him back forever, no longer as a slave. So yay, freedom, but more. I mean, no longer as a slave is pretty straightforward, but more? What's that? What can be more than a slave being given his freedom to Paul? I'm glad you asked. What were the implications of Paul's letter? What was he asking Philemon to do in front of the rest of the house church? What is Paul asking the church to do? What is Paul asking Onesimus to do by sending him back to his master? Last week, we learned that there's much to gather from this little letter, especially when we take Paul's rabbinic Judaism into account as he embodies the very theology he teaches in Romans. Contrary to surface level readings, or to surface level views, this letter is as theological as the rest of the New Testament. And I dare you to find it. When we consider that for the Jewish people having experienced slavery for themselves on a number of levels and experiencing oppression from invading nations and warring kingdoms, Paul is no stranger to the Hebrew Bible parallels found in exile and redemption with slavery and liberation and freedom. This is not new, as it's been. The Bible carefully ties these two together often. In the Hebrew Bible, the Israelites are commanded to celebrate the Passover to commemorate what? The redemption of God. How did he redeem his people? Glad you asked. He liberated them from their Egyptian masters. That is what they celebrate in the Passover. Zeman Chiruteinu, the time of our freedom. In fact, church, the Exodus would embody the biblical motif of God's unfailing love and salvation throughout the scriptures, as does Paul in his own theology. You see, the atrocities of slavery are carefully compared to the abuse through sin we unleash on the world. As slavery abuses the entirety of a person's dignity, body, and all of it, so too do, so too do the sins we commit to one another due to the world. And to each other. As slavery holds one in chains bound to the will of another, so too does sin's curse hold humanity in its grip. For Paul in the Hebrew Bible, freedom was not merely an act of manumission or abolition, freedom from slavery. It was a matter of redemption. Something that is blatantly obvious. In this letter. Hmm? Fascinatingly, the Bible library uses human situations, human structures, social ones especially, and issues to describe and display these themes in greater depth and for our benefit. More importantly, church, the theological trajectory of Scripture is a world without slavery, a world without sin, all leading to hope. What is hope and good news for people in bondage? Hmm? What does hope and good news sound like, not just for Philemon, because we can connect to that pretty easily. What's hope and good news for Onesimus as he makes his way back to the church to read this letter to his master? Hmm? This world without slavery, this world without sin, that leads to hope and good news, was something not, that was not something Paul only taught, but in this letter, it's something he embodies and brings to life. Let me show you. For while we might equate freedom 
with independence. Freedom is an act of redemption in Scripture. The results of the opposite end of the spectrum of exile and separation. I don't think it's a coincidence that Paul referred to what happened between Philemon and Onesimus as a separation. There's so many things Paul could have said here to let you know what was going on between them, but he does not do that. He's super overt about a bunch of other things, but just does not do that. Why do you think that is? You see, this theme of separation and exile is not an old one, and its comparisons to slavery are in Scripture as the result of what sin does to the world and to the people in it. Hmm? Separation and division, the work of the enemy. The biblical texts comparing exile to slavery are profound. Because they imply separation due to, how did Jesus put it? Choosing another master or serving two? Hmm? It implies sin having an abusive ownership over one's will and desires. It implies exilic exclusion as the punishing result of placing one's allegiance and loyalty to other gods. That's how you read it in the Old Testament. Exile in scripture is presented as the very bitter reality of a world with no hope. The opposite end of the spectrum of redemption. Look at it in Galatians 4. I love how Paul puts it here in Galatians 4. Look at this. So you, believer, are no longer a, what's the word? Slave. You are no longer a slave, but a child. In the same way that Paul describes Onesimus. He brings my heart with him, he says. And I'm here to plead for my son, my child, Onesimus. And if a child, <clears throat> then also an heir <laughs> through God. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were, what's the word, enslaved to beings that by nature are not God. You see, slavery spiritually was an act of being willing to submit to everything but God. And here's a hint in case you didn't know it. Wanting to do my thing instead of what God is compelling me to do through his love is the same thing. It's choosing to idolize me and my will. How I see things. Wanting to make God in my image. As opposed to knowing that I am made in his. And living like I am made in his. And seeing others as if they were made in his too. You all with me church? Jesus came to bring liberation. Not making it up either. Luke 4.11. Everybody knows this by heart almost, right? Jesus picked up the scroll, opened the scroll, and said and read what from the book of Isaiah? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to what? Preach good news to the poor, to set free the captive, to free those who are oppressed, and to give sight to the blind. That sounds like good news, man. Hmm? Sounds like hope. To me. By comparing the redemption of the soul to the liberation from slavery, we also learn that God's trajectory with these ideas are not the same as humans. God's desires, God desires the liberation and freedom of the oppressed and express it as such by connecting these two ideas throughout the story of the Bible. For Paul, the point of this letter, church, isn't a transformation of social systems. I'm sorry to break it to many of us, but that's not what he's trying to do here. He's not trying to transform social systems. It was a transformation of the heart that resulted in transformed social worldviews that in turn truly impact social systems. You see, for Paul, what's the point in attacking the institution of it if the heart that made it is still left unaddressed? 
What is the point in engaging and trying to break down something that this very destructive heart, this very deceptive heart is just going to rebuild with another label? Because that's how human hearts work, right? That's what it means to be enslaved. Even to yourself. And I can't get it to how chainy that one is. How hard that is to break. Paul's request to Philemon wasn't to directly free Onesimus. It was that Philemon changed the way he saw Onesimus. Look how he puts it. I love this verse. Blows my mind still to read it. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while. So that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave. No longer as the way you saw him. No longer as the property you deemed him as. No longer as whatever it is that caused the rift between you two. But more than a slave. A beloved brother. You know what's fascinating? I was reading a commentary this week on the book of Philemon. And this scholar, sorry I don't remember the name, Longnecker, I think his name is, or something like that. He suggests that in ancient Rome, there is a very big possibility, given the you know, nature of slavery in ancient Rome, that Onesimus was actually his biological brother. Because in ancient Rome, if you were the pater familias, right, and your father before you, had, you know, held the house and had slaves, if your father had relations with any of his slaves and had kids, none of those kids were considered legitimate. They weren't considered his sons, technically. There's a chance Onesimus might have been a beloved brother. We don't know that. Might look like it. That adds a completely different layer to things, now doesn't it? Because is a Christian slave owner supposed to treat members of his own family? You can take it further. How are Christians supposed to treat members of their own family? Are you with me? Do you hear what I'm saying? Paul's request to Philemon wasn't to directly free Onesimus. It was that Philemon changed the way he saw Onesimus. Letting the redemption of his soul be the catalyst for the transformation of his worldview. The transformation of seeing someone as everyone else sees him. The transformation of seeing someone the way the norm of society sees him. To be a little bit different. Actually radically different. And see him as more. From property to brother, from useless to useful, from slave to more than a slave. For Paul, knowing Jesus means it challenges our biases, especially about people in real life, not only theoretically, but practically, and held accountable by those who love us, mind you. Just like Paul addressed the situation in the context of the church and not individually. You would have thought he would have talked to Philemon and Onesimus privately. Deal with the issue in house. But that's not how he decided to do it. Is there any chance the text would challenge us? And how we see ourselves and those around us? Do we see ourselves as the owners of our lives individually and collectively? Or do we see ourselves, as Paul mentions in the book of Romans, no longer slaves to sin? slaves to righteousness. You see, Paul doesn't just use the comparison of slavery and freedom as is taught in the Hebrew Bible. He'll take it a step further. He'll say that what Jesus did is a, is a reversal of roles, a transformation of the roles where we can now be informed as how this works. We go from being slaves to sin to being slaves to righteousness instead and calls that freedom for whom the Son sets free is truly free indeed. What does it mean to be a slave to righteousness then? Hmm? Can you see it? Paul's use and reversal of these ideas in his theology? 
Because of Jesus, God imputes righteousness to us. Look at how the book of Philemon semi ends <laughs> as he uh, writes to them. Right after he says, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. That means both in the church and out of the church. So if you consider me your partner, by the way, the word partner there, koinonos, it's the same word for koinonia, fellowship we use that for. It's more of a partnership because God has gifted you and me a gift. We are now co-partners with serving God. And so Paul is saying, if you consider me your partner in ministry, your partner in Christ Jesus, look what he does. Welcome him as you would welcome me. He doesn't stop there. As he comes to the end of the passage, he also says, if he has wronged you, verse 18, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge it to my account. Sorry, I didn't know you had a running tab. Charge it to my account. That should totally be dinging in your head. It should sound familiar. Romans 15, Paul says the same thing. Because of Jesus, God welcomes me. Jesus talking about the innkeeper in the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan. What did the Good Samaritan tell the innkeeper? If he, if he incurs any charges, bill me. Hmm? These verses are literal embodiment of imputed righteousness, as Paul teaches in Romans 15. Do you know what I mean by imputed righteousness? God sees me. I sin. So God sees a lot of that sin. Yeah? All of it, by the way, in case you're wondering. <coughs> Jesus forgives that sin. And according to Scripture, Jesus became the curse on my behalf so that I could become, so that I could become the righteousness. If you don't know where that is, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5.21. You'll see it word for word. He who knew no sin became sin for me so that I could become his righteousness. You see, for Paul, what motivates a heart to change how you see someone is to truly understand how God now sees you because of Jesus. Which brings a lot of conviction because I'm not entirely sure I see other people or even myself the way Jesus does. Not that it's make or break. Hmm? I'm not very kind to myself, as you might imagine. Do you see you the way Jesus? sees you. Someone worth becoming a curse for? Hmm? Someone worthy of becoming righteousness? His righteousness? Because if the answer is no, man, <laughs> you're missing out. Sorry, I went off script. Uh, <laughs> when Paul tells Philemon, Anything he owes you, charge it to my account. If he's wronged you in any way, charge it to my account. I'll repay it. This is an embodiment of imputed righteousness, a real life example of how you put your theology into practice. A real life example of embodying what you believe. A real life example of how a human can emulate the love and righteousness of the crucified Christ. Hmm? All that being said, I would be misreading this book to tuck, in all, uh, to tuck in all this talk about freedom and liberation under the blankets of theological theory. So enter cruciformity. Cruciformity, church, is the call 
It is the hermeneutic through which we should see everything we do as Christians. Cruciformity. Conforming my way of living, my way of reading the Bible, my way of seeing other people, my way of seeing myself to the cross of Christ. Conforming everything I do to the cross of Christ. We get this from Philippians chapter 2. If you've got it, turn to it. Philippians chapter 2. We read it this morning, right? For even though he was in the form of God, though X, he was God, though, though he was in the form of God, not Y, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Get it? X, not Y, but Z. He is God. He did not regard being God as something to exploit. So what did he do? Empty himself. And he took on the form of a what? That should be hitting you right, like right about now. <laughs> Taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human forms, what did God do as a human? Humble himself and learned obedience through the cross. Embodied obedience, not live it. Embodied obedience to the cross. You put this together with what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and you've got quite a thing going on. Jesus himself said that unless you pick up, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and learn to follow me, you can't be my follower. That's, that's how it works. If we're going to define cruciformity based off of these passages, Philippians would describe cruciformity as the mind of Christ, right? Let this mind be in you as it was in Christ Jesus. What mind? The mind that would descend as a human being, not exploiting a single privilege as God for the sake of people you would think aren't worthy of that kind of love. Ooh. Obedience in a cruciform fashion. Thus, church, cruciformity is about conforming everything about and related to us to the cross of Christ. It asks the question, how am I being called like Simon of Cyrene to carry a cross like Jesus? How is this situation or circumstance leading me to follow Jesus to the cross? How are my kids teaching me about godly obedience and submission? How is my spouse and our engagements leading me to follow Jesus onto a cross? You know how many times I wish we asked ourselves this question in marriage? How is God using my spouse to teach me about cruciformity? How is God using my spouse to tell me this is a cross I need to hang on? Or pick up. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that the struggles we engage in in our lives, both in ourselves and others, are, is there any chance that they are meant to lead us to the powerful and life changing foot of the cross? Everything, and I really mean this, man, I cannot emphasize this enough. Everything about Christianity, everything about Christianity should be crucified. Everything about it should be cruciform. All we do should begin with where Christ calls his church to deny themselves, to pick up their crosses and learn to follow. In fact, according to Jesus, dear church, we can't follow him unless we do. We can't really follow Jesus unless we learn what cruciformity looks like in real life. You with me? Our theology of the kingdom, our interpretations of scripture, our vision for the future of the world, our outreach, our giving, everything about being a Christian should be cruciform. Learning humility by choosing obedience, whatever the personal cost. 
learning humility by choosing obedience, whatever the personal cost. Something Paul embodied himself in this letter and is calling both Philemon and Onesimus to do the same. What does cruciformity look like for Philemon? And what does cruciformity look like for Onesimus? Take a close look, for Paul calls them both to do the same, and yet they look very different. On one side, Paul, come, uh, Paul shows up with Onesimus and says, Onesimus is my son. You should, t- you should see him as you see me. Welcome him as you welcome me. If you consider me a partner in Christ, man. Then he turns his arm and grabs Philemon and does the same thing. Read. The first half of Philemon is doing this. I'm glad that you love the people at your church and that you serve and that if you could come serve me here in in prison, I know you would. That's the kind of person you are. And he brings them both together and says you should see each other very differently. Blessed are the peacemakers, he says. Hmm? Denial of self can be a denial of privilege, a denial of power and its benefits. But it can also include courage instead of submission. It can include forgiveness over vengeance. And being willing to sacrifice whatever the personal cost would be. Whatever pearl of great price you hold to follow Jesus. For Philemon, Paul's request is huge. It is a request to relinquish power, to radically change his views about slaves. Despite how normal it was at the time for Philemon. Cruciformity denies his right to his property in lieu of receiving a beloved brother. Hmm? However, for Onesimus Church, cruciformity looks very different. For Onesimus, it looks like Jesus speaking truth to power before Pilate courageously. For him, it probably looks like denying himself the right to vengeance against Philemon. For Onesimus, cruciformity leads him to choose hope when the situation does not promise it. Can you imagine being Onesimus coming back to read this letter, man? I'd be sweating bullets (laughs) from the stress alone. (laughs) The hope that Philemon would have an open heart The hope that the church would listen to Paul's calls for partnership, which, by the way, is another pattern you'll see in the letter. You'll see it in verse 6 and in verse 17, the concept of partnership and koinonos. Picking up our cross implies being willing to undergo whatever the personal circumstances are that lead us into the sufferings of Christ and practicing obedience in spite of them. Did you hear that? Picking up our cross implies being willing to undergo whatever the personal circumstances are that lead us into the sufferings of Christ and practicing obedience in spite of those circumstances. Something James would call enduring. Cruciformity doesn't come to life when I think or ponder what scripture says. It comes to life when we act in a way that honors the faith that compels us to. For faith without works is very dead, church. I can't imagine what kind of implications socially, personally, and spiritually this meant for both of them. I can't imagine how Philemon would have reacted or how Onesimus would respond to that reaction. All we know is the cross Paul called them both to bear for the sake of Christ. Sometimes bearing our cross in the cruciform path of obedience is individual and sometimes communal. The church would hold Philemon accountable now, right? Both Philemon and Onesimus had people in their collective corner as they engaged this work together. You see, while some of us might think there were people in either corner and this is a battle, the way Paul writes the letter is he saw Philemon and Onesimus dealing with something and the church was in their corner. And 
And that should give me conviction too. Because all too often the church is a center for all the gossip as opposed to holding people truly, gently, lovingly accountable. If Philemon was read in your church today, how would you react? With all the social implications it has. The church had been called to walk through this together with them. As we are called to practice cruciformity in all that we do today. Please join me in prayer. So Holy Spirit, open our eyes, our minds, and our hearts. We ask that you would stir in us the desire and the will to be different people. To see and engage your word in a different way. Holy Spirit, teach us how to read you. How to wonder, how to consider, how to question. May opening your word today reveal our hearts to you and to ourselves. We pray that the living and active word become the implanted word that grows in our heart. Teach us how, Holy Spirit, through your word and in one another. Grant that we would have the patience to listen, to be slow to respond, to consider carefully and grow together. May we live out your great love for your world and may it start right here, right now. Build your kingdom here in us, we pray. We ask all these things in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Church, would you please join us for the song of response, Lord, whose love and humble service. five minutes of this service. So, council. The church council. If you guys could make your way up here real quick. We are going to install new members to our church council. We're going to pray for them together as a church, lay hands on them, kind of like we do for the kids. 
So if you are a current council member or a previous council member of any kind, if you just make your way up here, we're going to pray for people. And I need the, the new folks, one right here, and one right here. Sorry, I, uh, I, one more needs to be here. Thank you. There we go. <laughs> All right, well, we've got two elders coming off, and, well, two coming on, and one deacon, our sister. So, church, one of the things that we do here at this church is leadership is selected by the people that are here. And they're brought together by the people of this church and the membership of this church. We pray for them. As God calls us all to the mission and work, his work in the world. So this is an act of commending them to the Lord. Yes? So I'm going to read a few charges to you guys. And if you can respond with, we do God helping us, that would be awesome. Because that's the right answer. <laughs> also... We don't do this multiple choice for a reason, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. All right. To express your acceptance of these offices, you are asked to stand and hear in the presence of God, his church, to answer the following question. Do you believe that in the call of this congregation, God himself is calling you to serve in these ways? Do you believe that the Old and New Testaments are the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life? Do you subscribe to the doctrinal standards of this church, rejecting all teaching which contradicts them? Do you promise to do the work of your offices faithfully in a way worthy of your calling and in submission to the government and discipline of this church? What is your answer? Good job, thank you. And this is your charge. I charge you elders as shepherds of the flock to hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that you can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. We ask elders to be a friend and Christ-like example to children, to give clear and cheerful guidance to young people. By word and example, we ask that you bear up God's people in their pain and weakness and celebrate their joys with them. Hold and trust all sensitive matters confided to you and encourage those who are older to preserve in God's promises. Be wise counselors who support and strengthen the pastor. Be compassionate, yet firm, and consistent in rebuke and discipline. And to you, deacons, to inspire faithful ministry of service to one another, to the larger community, and to the world. Remind us that the Lord requires us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. We ask that you teach us to be merciful and how to seize new opportunities to worship God with offerings of our wealth, time, Ability. We realize that benevolence, that benevolence is a quality of our life in Christ and not merely a matter of financial assistance. Therefore, we ask, we ask you to minister to rich and poor alike, both within and outside the church. Weigh our opportunities for giving and service and use the church's resources discerningly and wisely. To you, church and people of God, I ask you to receive these office bearers as Christ's gift to the church. Recognize in them the Lord's provision for a healthy congregational life. Hold them in honor. Take their counsel seriously. Respond to them with obedience and respect. Accept their help with thanks. Wholeheartedly participate in the ministries into which they hope to lead you in. Sustain them in prayer and encourage them with your support, especially when they feel the burden of this office. Acknowledge them as God's servants among you. Do you, congregation and people of God, pledge to receive them as you have been charged? We do. That is the right answer. Now join me in prayer. And if you would extend your hands toward here, and yep, if you guys can yep, lay hands, we're going to pray for these guys, all right? Father, we bring these new office bearers and the entire council of the Oak Harbor Christian Reform to you. Our merciful Father in heaven, we thank you that you have provided faithful and gifted people to serve as our elders and deacons. As these new office bearers assume their responsibilities, fill them, fill them, fill them with your spirit. Endow them with your wisdom and grant them strength. 
Make them faithful workers in your vineyard under their guidance. May your church grow in every spiritual grace in faith, which is opened and unashamed, and in the committed service that promotes your reign, your kingdom in the world. Help us, your people, to accept them gladly, encourage them always, and respect them for the sake of your precious Son, our Lord, in whose name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Thanks, you guys. And now, would you please stand so that I could bless you. Also another favorite part of the service for me. People of God, may he bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine over you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance over you and give you peace. A shalom that cannot be understood or comprehended. And that guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Love you all. Don't forget the potluck.